I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In episode 3 we learned all about the heroes of faith of chapter 11, how faith acted in every one of these heroes' lives, and we'll now be learning in episode 4 about how faith is produced in our lives and how Jesus does it. We will also be discovering how to increase our faith and how to exercise our faith, and we'll even learn a little bit about sheep and sheep farming. This is David Wells, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this is the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. The last two chapters of Hebrews tells us how faith is produced in our lives and how God goes about making us strong in the faith. Hebrews 12 verses 2 says that Jesus is the pioneer of our faith. He is the one who led the way. He is the one who made the way into the Holy of Holies first so that the rest of us could follow into God's presence. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 20 Jesus is also the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who brought it to completion. He did not just start it, he finished it. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus do it? First, Hebrews 12 verses 2 says that Jesus endured the cross. In Gethsemane he determined to carry out the will of the Father. Matthew 26 verses 39 He did this by focusing on the joy that was to come. He looked forward with joy to the people he could save. Second, Hebrews 12 verses 2 says that Jesus scorned the shame of the cross. Crucifixion was a gruesome, agonizing death, in addition to the public humiliation and shame. Jesus was ridiculed as he was hanging on the cross. The sign that was hung above him had the words, King of the Jews, written on it. It was sad since it was true, but those who murdered him did not believe it. Others on the ground mocked him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. Luke 23 verses 35 The irony is that he could only save others by not saving himself. As he was the true Messiah, this prevented him from coming down off the cross. He was the Chosen One and he had been chosen for the very purpose of dying, as God's sacrifice for sin. It is also an irony that God would deliver him, but only after he endured the cross. Third, Hebrews 12 verses 2 says that after Jesus' death, God raised him from the dead, and Jesus ascended into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God the Father. This signifies Jesus' authority. The words, at the right hand, mean this, and the fact that his work is finished, he sat down. This position is contrasted with the priests at the time who were still standing and offering daily sacrifices. Look at what Hebrews 10 verses 11 to 13 says. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. We are made strong by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 verses 2 You can look at all these other heroes of faith, Abraham, David, Moses and Samson, as well as the whole host of the more modern equivalents like Martin Luther, John Wesley, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Corrie ten Boom, and they all can inspire you, but they cannot enable you. But when you look at Jesus, he will not only inspire you, he will empower you. And that is why in Hebrews 12 verses 2, we are encouraged to look away from these others unto Jesus, because he is the author, the pioneer, and the finisher of our faith, who will make us strong in the time of weakness. Now, the following point will probably be difficult to accept. Our faith is increased by living constantly in trouble. These are the disciplines of life. 
God allows us to have problems because that gives us the opportunity to exercise faith. If you did not have any problems, how could you exercise faith? If you did not have any difficulties, how would you ever learn to depend? That is why you can count on trouble and that is why it can encourage you. Finally, we exercise faith. We learn faith by encouraging one another, by considering the resources God has given us. Hebrews 12 verses 18 to 20 says, You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast, and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Have you considered how terrifying this must have been? We are not to be driven by fear. We are not driven by the law with its demands upon us, do this or else. We are not driven by self-effort, by the grinding teeth and the clenched fist and the determination that we are going to serve God. If we serve because we are afraid, as the law frightened Israel in this terrible scene on Mount Sinai, we will lose something from God. It is not fear that should be our motive. It is fullness. That is what God has given us. But we have not come to that. Read Hebrews 12 verses 22 to 24 with me. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness, instead of crying out for vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Isn't this wonderful? Doesn't that encourage your faith? So, with this in mind, we have come to the final warning. Hebrews 12, verses 25 to 27. Take care that you don't refuse the one who is speaking. For if people didn't escape when they rejected the one who gave them earthly warnings, how much more if we turn away from the one who speaks from heaven? At that point, his voice shook the earth, but now he has issued a promise in the following words. One more time, I will shake not only the earth, but the heaven as well. The phrase, one more time, shows that the things that are to be shaken, that is, the created things, will be taken away, so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Personally, I am convinced that beyond those times, everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. What does this world depend on? Governments, politics, the economy, laws, all these things are the foundation of our history. These are things we have all relied on, trusted in, and counted on to keep our lives going, but every one of them is something that can be shaken. We are facing those times when God is going to allow everything to be shaken that can be shaken. That is everything that we can see and experience. But what cannot be shaken? Well, he tells us in Hebrews 12 verses 28 to 29, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude and offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is indeed a consuming fire. Are we consumed with God? What is the kingdom of God? It is the rule of God in our hearts, the right of Jesus Christ to be Lord within us, and it can never be shaken. This is what is being tested today. All the emptiness and artificiality of the world is being exposed. Have you seen how many people who are professing that they were Christians and apparently strong are now falling away and have renounced the faith in our present day? That is because their kingdom is crumbling and falling away. It is falling away because it is not built on the right of the Lord Jesus to be Lord and King. The last few verses 
at the very end of this letter, give us a word of encouragement that we need in the face of perilous times. It is both a prayer and a blessing. Hebrews 13 verses 20 to 21 Now may the Lord of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'm sure you have read about nuclear submarines that can cross the oceans without ever coming to the surface. The secret of their power lies in their nuclear reactor that does not need any refueling but is constantly giving off energy, so that the submarine never needs to go to port for refueling. This is the life of a Christian. This prayer reveals the nuclear reactor for every Christian. Look at the first phrase, Now may the God of peace. Hebrews shows us what peace is. What did Jesus promise us in John 14 verses 27? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Paul explains this special God-given peace in Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7. And here I read from the Amplified Bible, which expands and explains the word peace so very well. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, definite requests, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. And God's peace shall be yours, that tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God, and being content with its earthly lot, of whatever sort that is, that peace, which transcends all understanding, shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The nearest equivalent we have today to describe this state is emotional health. In Christ, we are in touch with the God of emotional health. God intends for us to live our lives on a level of peace which transcends and is above all human reason and understanding. Look at the next statement in the final prayer of Hebrews. Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. I know a little bit about sheep. I used to train border collies for quite a few years and spend a lot of time with the sheep farmers who use these specially bred dogs to herd and control the sheep. Also, my brother-in-law has a small sheep farm near Toes River, and we have spent some time there seeing how one can manage and farm with sheep. Two things I have learned about sheep from my brother-in-law and working with border collies. Sheep have no wisdom, and they have no weapons. Sheep are forever running off and getting lost, and are unable to find their way back, and if anything attacks them, or they get into trouble, they are utterly helpless to defend themselves. That is why sheep need a shepherd. And that is why Christians need a shepherd. And why the Bible likens us all to sheep. We have the great shepherd of the sheep. Our God is our great shepherd, who is here to watch us, because we have no wisdom, and we have no weapons for our defense. Another great process is spoken of here in the prayer of Hebrews 13 verses 20 to 21. Who brought back from the dead by the blood of the eternal covenant. Here we have the cross and then the resurrection. The cross means the end of the old life that relies on our own abilities and the resurrection releases us into the power of the new life. This is the power that is released within the Christian by the indwelling Christ within him, the resurrected life. Many people talk about the conquest of outer space as being the greatest feat that man has ever accomplished. But the greatest conquest that has ever been made was when the Lord Jesus conquered our inner space by moving into the heart of man and placing within us the greatest power by which life can be lived, the resurrected life. The outcome of all of this is that God will equip you with everything good that you need to do His will. You do not have to ask God to do this. He is already there within you to equip you with everything to do His will. 
God is going to work through you, not apart from your will, but right along with it. As Pastor Ray Steadman said in one of his sermons on the book of Hebrews, We choose and we start out, but Christ is there to carry it through to the end. Look at those words in the prayer of Hebrews 13 verses 21. His will working in you, that which is pleasing in his sight. You are assured that you are going to please God. You cannot help but please him when you walk this way and live by this faith. And that is what I said to you back in episode 1 of this podcast on Hebrews. You are fighting a battle that is already won. If any of us try to live by doing anything ourselves of the flesh, we are fighting a battle already lost. The whole of Hebrews is wrapped up with the most life-changing phrase we will ever encounter in Hebrews 13 verses 21. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, that is the secret of life. That is the object of faith. That is the way God intended man to live in our present circumstances, whatever they may be. Grace be with you all. Amen. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 4.